everybody. Uh, my name is Martha Campbell, and I would like to welcome you to tonight's Will Talk with Artists. Our digital discussion tonight is with photographer and mosaicist Natalie McGuire. McGuire combines two very different art forms to create new ways of experiencing places and ideas. By using her photosaic, she's able to tell a different kind of story than just one medium alone can. Uh, I would also like to introduce the host of our show, Will Scott. Will is an art historian with an extensive career as a photographer and the former head of adult programs for the National Gallery of Art. He is uniquely qualified to help bridge the gap between artists and the public, and he'll be our guide into the art world tonight. So I think with all that said, we can start. Will? Well, thank you, Martha. Thank you for the introduction and your uh, excellent support uh, on each of our sessions. And uh, also thank you for some of the loyal listeners uh, observers who have joined us tonight, particularly the Urals, and Victoria Frierson, who uh, I used to cycle with her husband until they moved away from the Annapolis area recently, so I'm glad she's sticking with us. And most of all, uh, Natalie, I want to uh, thank you for agreeing to subject yourself to this. Uh, thank you. Uh, I'm really excited to talk to you because uh, as a photographer, I have looked at your website, of course, and I think your photographs are uh, very, very strong. But uh, most of all, the fact that you have this unusual combination of materials uh, is something that I've not encountered before, and we're going to explore that. But also uh, because you're a member of the MFA but live in Minneapolis, uh, it's very exciting for us to have people from that distance away. Uh, I think our organization offers enough uh, to interest you and, and convince you to become a member. Uh, so thank you for doing that and thank you for participating tonight. Um, so I think where I want to begin is, first of all, uh, in reading the biographical material that you put on your website, uh, a couple of things jumped out at me that I just want to at least give you a chance to uh, share a little bit about uh, your history and uh, how you developed as an artist and became interested in photography. And one of the things was that your grandfather was a photographer. Uh, so I guess the question, I would, I've asked you this, but I would want you to share it with all of our listeners. Did you know your grandfather? Did he have any personal influence uh, through his work on your decision to be a photographer or what you're doing today as a photographer in terms of subject and style? You know, I honestly, I knew my grandfather. He passed away when I was about 11, 12, but I didn't know he was a photographer until I started getting into it in, um, in later years. And I was actually inquiring then about his camera equipment. Um, and looking back on some of his photos, uh, my grandfather was one of those depression era, you know, uh, workers. And so for him, when he shot back in the day, he shot black and white because that's all he could afford. And then he would hand color the images to make a color image. So I found that out afterwards. And then my dad has the compositional eye. So it's kind of a genetic family yeah. um, trait. And my older brother has the composition as well, but none of them in my family have taken it to the level that I have. Yeah. This is truly something that's born with me. And I also got the creative I were the craft part, not necessarily the photography, from my aunt. So yeah. So your your uh, grandfather was an amateur photographer. What sort yes. of things did he do? Just family photographs. Uh, he did. Vacation. And actually, you know, he did family around the neighborhood because he didn't get to travel much. Mm -hmm. um, he was in East Side of St. Paul, born and raised, and um, lived in a house that my grandmother was actually born and raised in. So they didn't move very far. Yeah. Yeah. Um, for me, and for the photos I see, they actually took a lot of baby pictures of me with my grandmother holding me next to the light. <laughs> so I'm thinking that's how maybe I got the bug. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> you know, the well, that, that's, that's fun to know because uh, when you hear something like that, you think, oh, well, you know, there's a sort of family lineage and the family's very artistic and creative. I don't know where I got any creativity because neither <laughs> of my parents had any. In fact, my father thought uh, art was just kind of you know superfluous so who needs it that kind of thing so uh, the other thing though and this is even more fascinating to me you mentioned on your website that Ansel Adams and Bob Ross <laughs> were influences Ansel Adams I get just by looking at your photographs and his reputation Bob Ross <laughs> 
has never been one of my passions. So why don't you tell everybody a little bit about how that works for you? You know, um, PBS as a kid, growing up watching PBS, the creative channels, um, Ansel Adams, I just loved his black and whites. I love the black and white landscapes. I never got the opportunity to do the dark room like he did. I was uh, kind of forced to go into digital and my black and whites are gonna be an infrared. That's a different story. Um, and, but Bob Ross, I just love the creative. You know, there was this local crafter too. Her name was Donna's Day. She was another influence for me as well. So I just, something that got my creativity going. And then it forced with Bob Ross, it kind of forced me to, when I went out into nature to kind of look at the trees, are they happy or aren't they happy? You know, is the brook babbling? So it made me look at nature in kind of a whimsical way. Yeah. Um, thanks to Bob Ross. So you, you got the sort of fine art, high art, serious photography from Ad Adams, which is understandable, but Bob Ross, it was more emotional, sort of the enthusiasm, the emotional significance of being creative and sharing that. Yeah. Is that fair? Yeah. Yeah. Well, uh, that's great. And since you didn't have a formal academic training as a photographer, uh, I think we'll just sort of jump ahead to who you are and how you create your uh, photographs today. And I see you have a wonderful, uh, this is your studio workspace that you're sitting yep. in? Right behind me, yes. These are all the photos that I currently have. I'm just gonna kind of give you a little detour here. So I'm kind of yeah. sitting in a, what's that, no, formerly a formal dining room, which is now my studio. And there's my table where I'm working on some pieces. Yeah. So yeah. I just thought I'd share that. Well, that's yes. great uh, to see all your work together like that. I, that must give you a real sense of satisfaction and perhaps inspiration too. You look at what you've done in the past and think of how you might do it differently. Yeah, I do actually, and it, it is. Um, watching a previous interview, it depends on the mood and what I'm going on. Um, and it depends on the glass. Sometimes that glass has its, and I'm sorry to, to further extend um, on my mosaics, I actually use sheets of stained glass. And so I will cut these down into little pieces. So, I mean, and it depends. I mean, I'll cut them down to this size, tiny, tiny little pieces with my hand. So with that, but it, that scene depicts on how I do that. Yeah. So if I'm looking at a tree, like you'll see the yellow gobera daisy behind yeah. me, mm -hmm. um, that'll depict on how I cut the glass. And I'll take exactly what I need and cut it down and tumble it. So yeah, I, the energy and the moods and even the scenes when I go out shooting, I'm actually thinking as I'm looking through the lens, can I make this into a photo mosaic? Wow. I actually have trained myself and actually changed my style so that if I can, I'm definitely going to make it into a frame. Well, let's dig into that because I, I've never seen anybody else do this. Mm -hmm. And I think you do it in a very beautiful and effective way. Uh, and I'm curious, first of all, how long have you been doing this? And secondly, what gave you the idea to combine these two medium? media in the way that you have? Well, let me start with the story because it is funny. Um, I was picking agates on the North Shore of Lake Superior with a friend of mine. And I don't know if you guys are familiar or if you have horse flies where you guys are at, but they're notoriously oh, yeah. for eating, eating you up alive. Yes. So I encountered one of those and forced me into Lake Superior. And I had my <laughs> film camera at the time. Yeah, it forced me into Lake Superior. I'd rather freeze yeah. my tuchus off than you know deal with a horse fly. Yeah. So as I waded in, I looked down and I saw this gorgeous scene of rocks, you know, deformed by the water and this light beam going through. And I went, I like that. So I take a picture. And as I raise my head, I had an epiphany and I'm like, rocks in the photograph, rocks in the frame, 3D effect. You can look at it and touch it. It's multi-sensory. Mm -hmm. So that's what sparked it for the creativity. And I did early days, I did acorn, pine cones. I actually dried flowers and leaves and put them on the frames, anything that I could bring the essence out. Um, well, and I, that's interesting that you've got it from that sort of um, visceral uh, physical experience. <laughs> uh, but there are many people that have done something similar to that. I mean, it's not, in my experience, uncommon to go to an exhibit and see someone doing that because it sort of amplifies the image and the content uh, subject of the uh, image. 
But what you're doing is really much more complex, I think, because as you said, you have to take a piece of glass, you have to cut it down, you have to make decisions about color, shape, uh, et cetera. Yes. So how did you transition from what you just described to what you're doing today? I really wanted to create a product that really brought the essence of that photograph out into the frame. And I went into a stained glass shop and that was all she wrote. You know, I was like, oh, because I used to make mosaic candle holders. I mean, again, I've got the craft part of me and the photography. So it's that horsefly that actually helped me introduce the two mediums together. I actually shouldn't do this, just do this. Um, and with that, it really, once I went into the stained glass shop, that opened doors. And I would bring the photograph with me and color match. If you think that's a blue, that's blue, you get home, it's purple. So mm -hmm. I've learned that. I've got about 150 jars, mason jars, pre-cut glass already ready to go. So it, that was, you know, and I just- Did you have experience with glass, working glass yourself? I did you no, I, a little bit with the mosaics. I did like little glass beads. But then I started I'm like, oh, let's see if we can cut some of the stuff. And I would just get the broken glass. I wouldn't yeah. actually get the sheets and break them myself. So do you I'm ever do it with sea glass? Do you ever I work with sea glass? I haven't. I would love to, though. Yeah. Okay, well, let's get right into it then, because your images are very striking and uh, unusual uh, because of the media. So let's look at the first image, Martha. Now, Am I correct, uh, Natalie, that this is an infrared photograph? Yes, it is. Okay, so let's just talk about the glass component and then we'll get to the infrared. Well, I guess we should get first to the combination and why you presented it as you have in this instance. And then we'll talk about the infrared, okay? So um, tell us a little bit about the glass elements here. And this one, in this image, it just forced me to look at the shadows and the textures. So that's what I went for on this one. You'll see I wanted to bring that road out, that the paint and white lines. So I really wanted to bring the focus to that and to the pine trees themselves. You know, I want you to see that movement going through. So, um, and it's, I just, I really wanted to bring that essence back out into the frame. And this was actually my first infrared frame I did of this image. Uh -huh. I, wanted to give, I wanted to give myself a challenge of doing nothing but black and white. Yeah. And so I think that's a, a real challenge when you're talking about the uh, glass material because it's so colorful. And that's what we associate with the idea of uh, mosaics and glass, at least me as an art historian, you know, you think of the great um, early Christian Byzantine mosaics and, and things of that nature. And the other thing that strikes me though is you have this very limited palette and the shapes are more or less geometric, all of them, yeah. but your subject of your photograph is uh, primarily nature that doesn't have pure geometric shapes. So is that of any significance? No, I was just mimicking to bring it out. And I just, it almost kind of, I wanted to kind of give it a multi-textural look to it as well. You know, and that's what I liked about the mosaics. That's when I chose when I wanted to embellish the outside of the frame. I liked that I could cut the glass, uh, most of it in the shapes that I needed, mm -hmm. with the exception of circle. I haven't mastered that yet. When you're hanging something in the gallery, um, because you're combining in, and I'm just using these sort of as uh, sh shorthand, you're combining craft and, and fine art. Do you care if people touch them? No, and, I encourage it. And what do you think people get out of that tact tactile experience uh, looking at a photograph, which is, uh, m m you know, most people don't want their photographs to be touched if they're not covered because you can't get the fingerprints off. So. Oh, these are covered. I do have glass between the frame and the photo. So they are covered and protected. I want people to engage in the sensory. I actually met a gentleman who was blind and I described my scene and it's one of them coming up the Golden Gate Bridge. I described it with his fingers. And uh, I said, here's uh, the shadow of the bridge. Here's the bridge itself. And he ran his hand across it and he lit up. So I, I encourage people touching it and engaging. It's, you know, you can't, they're tumbled. So for most yeah. of it, the sharp edges yeah. have been removed. 
Do you do anything when you're presenting your work, when you have the opportunity to uh, have a little note uh, on the label or something to encourage people to uh, enjoy it tactily? Um, I do when I, I don't have anything up on the thing. Um, when they come into my booth, when I'm doing art shows, ah. by all means, I encourage it. I don't for the I don't encourage it in the gallery sake because that for their liability purposes. Yeah. So I leave yeah. that up to the gallery. If they want people to touch them, fabulous. If not, um, okay. Then let's jump ahead to the infrared because <laughs> I see <laughs> I a couple of our photographer members have joined in, uh, and and I have to admit that. Selfishly, I'm very curious uh, because I've sort of experimented and dabbled with it. And you have, um, I think, taken it to a level or a process that I wasn't aware of. So why don't you tell us a little bit about how you produce the infrared image? I have an old, again, Ansel Adams is coming out here. Um, but I did send one of my old um, digital cameras. I had, of, I go shoot Canon. So I sent one into a place, I think it's um, Life Pixel, if anybody wants to know about that, and had the sensor converted to an infrared sensor. So that way I could shoot like a normal visual color camera um, and do the normal settings as long as you don't shoot into the sun, do not shoot into the sun. And that way I shoot in color, I shoot in raw, I bring them back, I will upload them into Lightroom, minor tweak in there, and then I'll take the ones I like go into Photoshop and I will do a white balance correction. Um, and that's all I do. And I save that and I bring it back into Lightroom and kind of tweak it a little bit more, switch it from color to black and white and voila, this is the end product. It's really not that difficult. Um, some are different than others. Um, infrared is how objects reflect and absorb heat. So that's why you see the road is jet black. Yeah. So if you do bridges or anything with metal, it's going to come out extremely sharp yeah. where the trees, and I do a custom white balance as well. I apologize. I do actually use some of the pine needles or grass as my custom white balance. So try that when you go out. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Um, otherwise you can do a filter, but if you're going to have any wind, you're going to have motion blur. If that's what you want to go with, great. Um, cause I do actually have the light blocking filter as well. The infrared filter and a tripod is required and a time release remote yeah. cable. Yeah. So, so you, you don't like the filters because that actually creates a level of, um, complexity or motion that you don't want. Um, if it was, you know, isolating a certain area, fabulous. But when I wanted to get a seam and then half of it's blurry, it's kind of unattractive yeah. To, yeah. to my eye. Yeah. I've so seen uh, have, to, that. have you ever experimented with plugins and uh, those kind of presets that you could use to create uh, the infrared effect? No. Because you don't want to do that or you've tried it and it wasn't satisfactory? No, I've never done it. I didn't really know about it. <laughs> to be <laughs> honest. Yeah. I'm sorry. You know, I just, I kind of did some tutorials and found out how to do the, you know, to, to do the white balance correcting on actually just color photos. Yeah. If you didn't do the little, you know, the white yeah. balance card or the gray card. Um, so yeah, this is just me experimenting and kind of playing and doing some research yeah. and have well, at books. One of the things that strikes me, uh, and I'm imagining, uh, I can't say for sure that others uh, note the same thing. The road is a pure black and then the trees uh, are so brightly illuminated that it almost looks like snow is covering some of the trees and some of the ground where the sunlight is uh, the strongest. Are you cultivating that and intentionally utilizing it? Um, or is it representational that you actually uh, saw that intense contrast? I actually saw that intense contrast. I was actually, this is taken in Estes Park. So I'm heading up to the um, Continental Divide. Mm -hmm. Storms are racing down. I just, when I see a scene and I don't know if other photographers feel this way, it changes when it's something that captures my eye, it shimmers to me. So it's a <clears> weird <throat> personal experience that I have. I shouldn't say weird. It's just a personal experience I had. This scene spoke to me and I actually had a car gave me the hey hey go take your picture and so <laughs> I, they did and I should I should show you the picture of why I gotta find this in color this is the ugliest thing you will see in color 
the dark, <laughs> no, the dark part of the pine trees is dead. It, it's just gray, flat, just n nasty. You could, I couldn't, I couldn't Ansel Adams this if I tried in color. Um, but this particular scene in the infrared, when I brought that home and saw it in my camera and I was uploading, I'm like, <gasps> I mean, it was just like, oh. yeah, yeah. so it was a nice, happy accent. And, and yes, the highlight of the trees was the sun peeking through the clouds. 10 seconds later, it was all covered up and changed again. Yeah. Well, so I'm glad, was, I'm glad we've had this conversation about this piece because that, uh, lets me understand, I think clearly how creative you're actually being with your uh, material and with your process. Uh, and when you said, um, when you see a scene that you feel like you have to photograph, it affects you in a, a specific way. When I see something that I feel like I have to photograph, it's more like a, a jolt. Uh, and I, yeah. I like to drive, I yep. uh, especially like driving in the West and I'll just pull over to the side of the road and. If a trucker has to go around me, he's he or she's going to have to go around me. <laughs> yeah, I did that at uh, oh god, Garden of the Gods in Colorado yeah. Springs. Oh I yeah, I had that park to myself, and it says no stopping in the middle of the street. I'm like, well, if a cop comes by, I'll pay for three tickets. I'll pay for them in advance. Yeah, I was there in June, and I had a small point and shoot, uh, but a you know a high end one in my pocket, and uh, I was on my bicycle with a friend, okay. so fortunately I could stop. Yes. I had the park to myself though, so I documented I the heck out of it. So, uh, uh, you're lucky. which is unusual. Yeah. Yes, you're very lucky. There were all kinds of people there the day I was there. Uh, so let's look at the next image. Uh, you really have some stunning images, and I want to make sure we get a chance to talk about all of them. Now, this is <laughs> to me very impressive because the scale of the whole piece is not terribly large, no. but this is a subject, especially those of us that have visited it. You know, I think of it as I got to have a really big print, you know, I've got to take a photograph that'll stand being blown up to 20 by 30 or something like that. And your photograph is even smaller. Yeah, eight by 10. in this particular is the photograph. And why, why did you take a subject that is so physically massive and present it in this way? Did you think about that in the process or did you just do it because that's what felt right? You know, honestly, I create my art in four different sizes. So I actually have this in a 30 by 26 okay. frame size, which is 11 by 14. Um, but this particular one, I, was, I did a social media post and I had a client go, oh, I love the Golden Gate Bridge. You know, mm -hmm. are you gonna make it? And I said, well, originally I was gonna make it in the small one. And I'll show you real quick here. This is what a small one looks like. It's a five mm -hmm. by seven photograph. So mm -hmm. um, it's kind of hard to see what this art looks like even in the, you know, what it looks like in person or it looks better in person. So she had asked, would you do it in an eight by 10? So my first image of this making it uh, wasn't an eight by 10. And I've made this a couple of times. This is my most recent one. And I will remake my pieces, but they're all original. Um, and I've even changed my style because if you look down underneath the Golden Gate Bridge, you see that shadow. Mm -hmm. I now make that a solid green piece. And then I do a solid red piece for the, the Golden Gate Bridge oh. at the base. Uh -huh. And then I layer on top of it. Um, the water is about four to five different colors of different aqua and green. I really wanted to add that wave and that texture and that depth. Mm -hmm. and I wanted to bring forward the, um, the plants in that yeah. lower corner. In the future, I might even do an extra layer on top of those weeds in that corner just to really give depth. I might actually go on top of that. So well, this is just very personal in my uh, evaluation. Having viewed the bridge from that vantage point, I think the way that you use the glass uh, to show the uh, movement of the surface of the water and the uh, vegetation in the lower left uh, is, is very compelling. It's really, it does what you've been talking about as one of your artistic goals, you know, to uh, create a more sort of tactile, uh, physical sensation uh, to a photograph. But the other thing that this makes me want to ask as a photographer is how do you decide what you're going to present in black and white and what you're going to present uh, in infrared? I photograph both. Oh, okay. I so you're always ready. I've got, you know, I'm actually 
starting a new project of doing comparisons between color and infrared. So I'm actually uh, starting, I've been always doing that, but now I'm kind of looking at it, but you know, I want to engage people and say, what do you see in the difference between the color and the black yeah, and the white? Yeah, so, yeah. and I actually- I think that's I do a very good idea. Mm -hmm. And I actually, in the infrared adds a moody drama, almost mm -hmm. 3D effect where the color, you're looking at the vibrancy of the color and the texture, you know, yeah. where you're infrared, you're just kind of like, wow, who, hey, you know, it could yeah. be dreamlike, yeah. it could be very dark. Yeah. Yeah. So I don't want to miss out. So I don't, <laughs> I don't pigeon, like some people will only photograph bridges or oceans or lighthouses. Yeah. I don't. Um, I'm going to photograph what mother nature exposes me to. Yeah. If that's I, I've tried that idea. That. You probably have become familiar with the uh, term um, body of work. And that's so common in uh, criticism and particularly in the gallery and museum world. And I just can't limit myself to that. The idea that I'm gonna make a project and I'm just gonna do bridges or I'm just gonna do, I don't know, trains or I'm gonna do spruce trees. I, I can't limit myself to that. Uh, maybe after time, I'll have enough of something that I'll do that, but I'm yeah. not gonna do it deliberately. Okay, let's look at the next image, Martha. Uh, this is, I'm, I'm just going to say before you comment on it, this is where I think what you're doing just works for me on every level. The color, the shape of the glass uh, 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 tesserae and the image and the whole thing. So how and why? I love this. Yeah, this one's one of my favorite. I call it green and it's green water, green cattails, green lily pads. I was actually drawn to this image because there were pelicans out feeding further out onto the lake. And as I came to the shoreline, I liked this was what ca captured my attention. So I nabbed it and knowing I was going to make this into the photosaics, I trimmed off the cattails and made mm -hmm. sure that the weed was in there to kind of really emulate that. Mm -hmm. um, and it's one of my best sellers. People love this. Oh, it's, I can um, it's very calming. And the brick-like pattern, I wanted to emulate the waves. Yeah. So in that green. And it's that's all one color sheet of glass for the green of the water. Um, and then I did the long strips cutting the, you know, to really mm -hmm. bring out that weed. I really want your eye to flow all over the place. Yeah. So do you think that you're adding something that is not inherent or intrinsic to the uh, image, the um, natural scene that you've observed yeah you know i just i don't know how to answer that <laughs> i just i just you know i just i love i want i love to engage people and want them to figure out what lies beyond mm -hmm. and what's what do you think is beyond this frame what do you see yeah. so i want to engage people's curiosity yeah that's what i was getting at and maybe Martha will tell me later that that was one of my hard balls. She says every now and then I'll throw one in. Um, I, that's okay. I'm not trying to make you uncomfortable, but no. that's <laughs> what I was looking for is for you to think about that and uh, respond. And you did very uh, well, I think. Very no, thank you. I appreciate that. I, you know, I got to learn to th think about my art differently as well, too. So I'm always open to different perspectives. Uh, so let's look at the next one. Uh -huh. uh, there this, you go. Kind of, this speaks to me and who <laughs> I am as a person, I guess, and as a photographer, but it's your work and um, it certainly makes you think when you see it. So tell us what you were thinking about or what you want us to think about. Ah, there's so many things on this image. Um, one, it needs to heed to its own warning sign or take its own advice. I, that's what I found. I found this actually, this scene actually very humorous. Um, it's actually on one of the river roads to, to give you a pending danger. But this is one of them. When I was looking at it, I actually sat on this one for six months. I actually had block on this one. I put down the long stringy black pieces and I actually cut them off of a big sheet of glass. You know, I just randomly uh -huh. cut them down and glued them. I didn't sand those bigger chunks. And then it kind of looked like a bunch of leeches on the frame, like, ugh. So I had to sit back and let it come to me. I had to relax my mind mm -hmm. and let it come to me. Mm -hmm. And once I did, I'm like, well, I don't want to do the leaves, you know, in with the frame. I didn't want it to be flat. So I was like, trying. how can I do that? Like with the Golden Gate Bridge. Mm -hmm. So once I figured that out and there is probably about seven or eight different colors of glass. 
because I wanted to give that speckled look to really kind of give you that uh -huh. texture of the bark and the highlights and the you know the crests and the valleys. Um, and once I got that figured out and I grouted it, then I went on top of that grout and you'll see I did stringer rod, uh, simple white glass rod coming up the top and mm -hmm. out the bottom. And then I hand cut the leaves. I found a pattern that I liked that really emulated it and just kind of simulated that out and actually hand cut them, hand sand, sanded them, glued those down. When that dried, then I put the stringer rod on top to really give that vein. I really wanted to give dimension to this yeah, yeah. otherwise 2D image. And that's my latest challenge. That's what I'm trying to do now is like, how can I add on top of it? How can I make it 3D? Mm -hmm. How can I make photography three-dimensional? There we go. That's yeah, th th yeah. Uh, well, I think that's a wonderful way to express it. And I was going to say, uh, as I listen to you particularly talk about this piece, you have consistently emphasized the uh, hand work that goes into creating these. Um, yeah. Are you proud of that handwork? Do you think that having the uh, greater involvement of your handwork in your work makes it somehow more worthwhile, significant, uh, valuable, uh, any pick your uh, adjective than you know, straight photography, than just- No, photography. I just really wanted, I love working with my hands. I like creating things. I can't paint, I can't draw, but I can do this. Mm -hmm. <laughs> you know, mm -hmm. I see these painters I'm like, oh, and these people who draw, I'm like, oh my God, I just yeah. love this. Yeah. So for me, I can kind of cut down, I'm good at, the, deconstruction you know or you know dismantling things and then piecing them back together so that's what i like about this is that gives me that freedom i know some people get how would how would i would describe it that artist block um mm -hmm. if i'm blocked i can go out shooting i can mm -hmm. put that frame aside go out shooting if i don't want to go shooting i can come in the studio and work on the frame if i don't want to do that i can work on glass to start prepping that and getting it cut so i have many stages of this that i never get burnt out mm -hmm. if that makes any sense yeah yeah uh, uh an artist friend of mine in portland oregon uh says uh that when she gets frustrated she uh, thinks of this phrase just keep rubbing two sticks together and eventually you'll make some fire yeah, I definitely, if I get stuck and I'm like, oh, I can't start, I can't start. I'm like, just glue the first piece down. Yeah. yeah. And I do that and then all of a sudden it goes poof. And then I'm like, okay. Yeah. <laughs> I think it's kind uh, of like an anxiety thing, you know? It's like, I don't want to mess it up. Yeah, yeah, good. Let's go to that next one. Ah, uh, yellow gobert dairy, yes. Uh, how knowledgeable are you about the history of art? And this is not a trick question or something to uh, for me to, evaluate the depth and breadth of your knowledge. I just think it's important here. I am not. I mean, I, if I, I go to art museums and such, I don't study other artists per se outside of, you know, like somebody catches my eye on a TV program like Bob Ross or Great American Experiences. I watch those things. Uh -huh. But have, have I studied underneath somebody? No. Okay. So was this work inspired by anything other than the flower itself? Actually, it was not. I went to um, a grocery store and I fell in love with this. I brought it home, put a macro filter on my camera and cut off half of it knowing I was going to make it into a, a frame. Because as soon as I saw this, I thought, oh, you love Van Gogh. You know, actually, you, I've been going to Van Gogh and all my mosaics, to be truthfully honest. I kind of yeah. get that Van Gogh feeling. Yeah. Um, so it's funny that you say that because I almost brought that up earlier, but I didn't. Yeah, well, I think that that here for me is not just uh, me being the art historian, but I think it's very apt and um, compelling for me because, you know, he developed that characteristic brush stroke. It's not the impressionistic brush stroke. It's that one that was his uniquely his own that had so much energy. And of course he used vibrant colors as you have here. Is yeah. that a sunflower or is that some other kind of flower in the photograph? I call it a Gabera daisy. Oh, and you have danger yeah. on there. Oops, yeah. <laughs> wrong label. No, I called it yellow Gabera daisy. Um, I, you know, some people call it a sunflower. So, you know, I could be wrong, but I yeah. labeled it I yellow I, Gabera daisy. I think you're right. I don't really know that much about botany. Uh, I don't either, but plants. I'm sure somebody's going to bring it in. So, <laughs> yeah. But I think that is uh, that type of daisy and not a sunflower. I was just curious because I love sunflowers. And I do too. 
Yeah. Okay. Well, uh, we're we're moving along. I think at a good rate. Uh, and the uh, final image is one that I, uh, when we were talking the other day, Natalie uh, brought this up and um, uh, told me about the experience that has led to what we're going to look at next. And most of our member artists don't um, strongly engage contemporary issues. Uh, some do. Uh, but when they do, it's in a more personal way, not to comment um, beside their own experiences, personal experiences. And I'm not in any way saying that Natalie's not doing that in this instance, but because it is engaging mm -hmm. such an important uh, contemporary social issue, I was fascinated by what she's done and actually admire what she's done. I don't want to say more about it. I want uh, Natalie for you to speak to this yourself. And if it oh. creates conversation and questions, uh, that's great because that's really what art to me is about. It's not just always beautiful, aesthetically perfect, but it can really open our minds and engage people in a conversation that is generated and sparked by art. And I think that's what you've done here. So. We'll let it, uh, Martha, please put it up and, and Natalie, take it away. Oh, okay, we have another beautiful image of the West. I, <laughs> oh, I forgot well, that. No, I let's, know, I was gonna say, if you wanna skip to the other one, we can. Yeah, yeah let's, because I think that we've said, so, well, geez, we have this. This I'm is really what sparked it. Day. No, you did not. This is what sparked it. I applied for the people that need the backstory and then you can interrupt and yes. push to the next yes. piece. Um, this is called Bridge to Wander. This is an infrared, and as you see, it is a summer shot. And with the white, it looks like everything is snow covered. It is not. I took that in June. Um, this one I did take with a filter. This is an older image that I took. Um, actually, no, it's not. I took it. it I took it in actually. I should. I, 2020, I think, not 2021. Um, but I took this shot because I really wanted to engage to when you cross over that bridge, what are you wandering into or mm -hmm. what are you leaving behind as you go forward? So this image I applied for a art exhibit in Texas. Now I applied for this exhibit before all these um, restrictive women's rights laws passed. Um, and they had delayed the announcement uh, for us artists to be notified. And I believe there was 42 artists out of five five, 600 applicants. I was one of those that was accepted into this. Uh, yes, I was very humbled and honored by that. And they notified me after the news had reported the law passed restricting women's rights. So if you wanna to go to the next slide, this is the image that they were going to get. Um, this is what they got. Um, I would have happened is I did a, a very nice, uh, rejection. I just, it took me about five hours to write this, a message to them stating, um, as a woman artist, I cannot in goodwill send an art to a state that doesn't respect women's rights. Um, so I said, I need to remove myself from this exhibit. The curator, oh my gosh, was an angel and suggested, would you be willing to do a blank frame with your politely worded message. Cause I didn't want to be mean cause I wanted to elevate this. And I also didn't want to punish them either because there are people in Texas who don't agree to this. So I didn't want to do that either. Cause I was thinking maybe I need to boycott Texas but I'm thinking, well then I'm, I'm hurting the wrong people and I'm not bringing awareness to this issue. So instead I sent them this 16 by 20 frame with a price tag of $10,000. All proceeds will go to a fund that'll help these women with these issues. Um, and I just, I put on there and that's what's on the back of the frame, empty frame, formerly known as bridge to wander. And this image to me for bridge to wander is kind of, it captures my soul and the way I want to see life and how life should be. It should be whimsical. It should be fun. It should be beautiful. It should be your imagination of what wonderful things can happen. Well, I can't get that right now with all these restrictions and where's it going to stop? So that's what I did. So if I'm understanding what you just shared with us uh, correctly, and I want you to tell me if I'm not, and tell me how I'm not, 
okay. is that this is an act of protest you're taking, not uh, over the issue of abortion, but on women's rights to determine their own uh, future, their own, uh, how they care for their bodies and decisions yes, that they make. exactly. It's women's rights. It's women's right to their own body and to make their own choices. It should be no one else's business but their own. That is the only thing I'm doing. This has nothing to do about the 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 birth, you know, the the abortion part of it. It's about their right to choose, and it should be no one else's business. Yeah. And that's I just I want to make sure about that because again, with all my heart and soul, when I got accepted, I actually looked. I'm like, okay, where's this going? It's uh -huh. in Tyler, Texas. Are they a Democratic county? I mean, I was trying to find <laughs> a way to send this piece of art to them, yeah. and everything came back no. But once I sent that email. As an artist and a woman, it was the best decision I ever made. If I never, if I only sell art in states that restrict women's rights, anybody's human's rights, I will never sell another piece of art again. That's how strongly I felt about this. Well, I'm just speaking for myself. I'm not speaking for the organization <laughs> in any way. Um, I respect and admire your decision. Uh, because as an artist who exhibits uh, around the country, I, you know, like you said, there were hundreds and hundreds of uh, artists who submitted and you were one of 42. Yeah, that yeah. is such a sense of accomplishment and satisfaction. It's very hard to overcome that self-interest and do something like what you've done. But is this is one of the most important functions of art in society, yeah. I think. So and uh, for I me applaud you. Yeah, and for me, it was a very hard decision. I've never done anything like this, but I can't stand by anymore. Mm -hmm. um, and the woman, um, the curator, even said, "You've earned this spot. You, I can't let you know. I don't want mm -hmm. you to let it go because you've earned this. So please put whatever message you want because that's what art is about. It's yep. engaging. It's called, you know, creating conversations. So um, yeah, that's yep. you know. So that was my." <laughs> Yeah, I'm proud. I was nervous about doing it because I was I actually posted on my social media pages. And I said, this is about women's rights. Please keep your negative comments to yourself or unfriend me because yeah. it's yeah. So well, I'm, I'm, I'm there. <laughs> uh, very, I admire you very much for having made that decision. And oh, now you. we do have uh, about 15 minutes. We try to stay within the hour and, you know, it is cocktail hour, dinner hour. We try to respect everybody else's uh, time. Uh, and uh, so Let's open it up to questions. Uh, any questions uh, that anyone has? Well, Valerie, did that uh, frame picture ever sell for ten thousand dollars? It is. It just shipped down. It does not actually open yet until October first, and it goes until January twenty second. I am putting that baby all over social media because the gallery will get thirty percent, but I will not keep a dime. The rest of that money, and it'll be if it does sell for ten thousand. $7,000 will go to Lilith Fund, which helps women get transportation back and forth. So even if I win Editor's Choice Award or People's Choice Award, I'm not keeping any money from this at all. I'm donating it as a stand to until they can get this solved. So good question. Thanks, Don. Mm -hmm. Thanks for sharing your work, Natalie. Really love it. Um, I, I'm having a, a problem with uh, seeing it closely enough. I can't tell what the frame is around the picture. Is that like, is that mosaic too? I'm it just is. curious about that. That is how you're stained framing glass. It. Yep. So it's a frame like this. So uh -huh. I actually will glue and it's a three inch wide frame because I wanted to bring the beef out. So you can kind oh, of, yeah, the photos don't really do it justice um, because it does kind of give you, it flattens it out. So here I actually put some of the tree trunk with the bark you know, the, to bring out the, the, uh, the tree branches. Mm -hmm. And I really kind of, I know this is kind of giving you a little bit of an example. Um, and the so, inner frame, that inner frame though, is, is, is matte board? This is just matting. Yep, this is a photograph mounted on foam core that's, and that's with the a, matting just to give that little separation. Mm -hmm. um, otherwise, people have asked me if I wanted to, um, if I'd go straight out to the edge. And I think you just need that mm -hmm. break. Mm -hmm. Um, at least that's what I have found. Mm -hmm. And here's mm -hmm. another one that I've done. It's a little bit more, this is more simplistic, but you can see like the bark. I really brought the bark out, mm -hmm. the grounds. Mm -hmm. And then of course the textures up here, I brought the red bark tree out. Yeah, yeah. So, 
Yeah, that's nice to see it closer. Yeah, yeah, yeah it is. They really work together really well. Yeah. Exactly. So these are just two of my examples that I have readily handy at my my fingertips. <laughs> so, David, so that's, that's a great question because I uh, was wondering about that and I should have asked it. Uh, and I, um, Natalie, I think it really makes a difference in uh, understanding and respecting what you do and how it functions. That now all of your um, comments about wanting people to experience it tactily, like your uh, anecdote with the uh, blind fellow, uh, yeah. that doesn't come across well at all no. uh, here on the uh, monitor or in this uh, photographs on the website. So it'd be great if you could find a way to, to convey that more um, clearly. Uh, yeah, and I, you know, I'm open to suggestions on that one because you can kind of see I've done little video clips where I think you can kind of see it a little bit. Yeah. That's, I just completed that one um, yesterday. So mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. that's the newest. It is, you know, I've been told numerous times that the art looks so much better in person than it does on print mm -hmm. or, you know, in some, on the website, which is a good thing. I mean, it's good because then when, cause I've seen some art look better online that it did in person, I'm like, oh, okay. Yeah. So mine is thankfully the other way around. I mean, it is gorgeous. Yeah. Not to toot my own horn. So good question, David. Thank of course, you. Of course. Yes, thank you. Uh, we have a comment in the chat, which is just Matt asking, or sorry, Max asking, uh, if the piece sells, uh, they would very much like to see it because they support this 100%. So I would suggest following Natalie on her socials. So yeah. Facebook, Instagram. Yep, and McGuire Studio, Twitter, and, uh, Twitter, Instagram, Facebook, I'm on there. I'm a little bit more conservative because I got people that kind of get a little eh. So, <laughs> but yes, I will definitely be posting that. And even on my website and mcguirestudio.com, I put blogs and exhibit information. So yes, if that one does sell, yeah, I'm all over that. I am going to, you know, I'm going to go, whoo -hoo, I finally did something larger than me, you know, for a good cause. Yeah. So so thanks, Max. Well, I think this has been a really good discussion, and I hope that uh, I've helped uh, draw out from you, Natalie, uh, what you're trying to accomplish as an artist and, and the process, uh, which is fascinating and, and, as far as I know, unique to you. Uh, if there aren't any other questions, uh, we'll wrap up. Martha? I, it's, not a quest it's not a question, so someone actually has a question. No? Okay, uh, I would just like to plug our next Will Talk will be on October 5th and we'll be talking with uh, painter, sorry, watercolors and also wearable art creator, uh, Stacey Lund Levy. Uh, so I'm looking forward to that. Yeah. Oh, also, uh, if you would like to be on a Will Talk yourself, um, you, if you're an MFA member, uh, the link to uh, submit your work is in the member memo, which goes out every Wednesday. So take a look for that. And collector's choice. Of course, Collector's Choice. The deadline to donate for Collector's Choice, if you're, again, an MFA member, is September 30th. And all of that info is at our website, mdfedart.org. And just okay. to let you know, I applied and I have donated the green one that we saw in today's presentation. Oh, get that up on the website. So, there you go. So okay. it's, well, I I'm haven't just, been accepted yet. I haven't heard if I'm accepted on it. So it's a donation. You're automatically yeah, accepted. Yeah, oh, okay, automatically perfect. Well, yeah. then I will put it out there so you guys know it's coming. So well, it's on my list already. <laughs> <laughs> okay. Well, thank you, uh, Natalie, for a wonderful conversation and uh, sharing your beautiful art. And uh, Martha, thanks for your help. And uh, to all the listeners, watchers, uh, thank you for tuning in today. We'll see you in two weeks, I hope. Perfect. Thank you, everybody. Good night. Good night.